Hey guys, this is Eric Weingartner with Weingartner Racing. Today's video is an update on how the 350 did on the dyno. For those that didn't watch the previous video, I'm gonna recap what the engine is just to make it simple. And I'm gonna answer as many of the questions and comments that I had from the very first video when I asked you to predict the horsepower in this video as possible. I'll tell you what was done on the dyno with this engine and what was tested. So here's the basic engine. This is for my sister. So I, for those that don't know, I have a twin sister. She has, has an 88 Firebird that she's gonna put it in. Um, we're gonna put it in, I should say. Um, it has a 2.8 liter V6 in it now. It's got, it doesn't have a posi, so it's peg leg, and she really doesn't care whatever power it made. She really wanted to make um, less power, just more than what she had before, which I think that thing was only rated like 120 horsepower. Um, she wanted to be reliable and not leak oil. That's pretty much all she asked. Reliable, not leak oil. Also, I don't want to hear any rum, diddy rum. That's what she said. So, this is what I tried to give her. This is a 350 stock block. It's a two bolt main block. It has ARP uh, main bolts, not studs. It did use cleavite coated bearings throughout the whole thing. It has an Eagle rotating assembly, one of the cheapest kits I could find that included the cast steel crankshaft, um, uh, 5.7 length long, long rods. They are fours and they've got ARP 3 8 cap screws, a pressed on hyperuretic, and I don't care if I'm mis uh, saying it wrong, sorry if that bothers you, piston, it's a flat top, four valve relief. I think they're from uh, Speed Pro or something like that. They look just like those 345 NP pistons. The block's 40 over, by the way. So it's not technically a 350, it's a little bit bigger. It's got these big 564 uh, rings in them. They're the pre-gapped ones. You don't even have to gap them. I did check, of course. It's got that. As far as the heads go, these are the Assault uh, Racing heads. Now, I poured it, and you're more than welcome to go back and look at that video and see what's been done. Because um, so I did a whole series on what, what, how you could modify that port and what it would do as far as flow bias goes. These have a two-weight intake valve, one 600 exhaust valve. After port work, they flowed 315. And they're about, I think I said 213 cc's, but I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what that number is. But we'll say 213. Um, some would argue that's too big of a head and it wouldn't make any torque. That was said a lot in the previous comments. The intake manifold is a former EPS uh, manifold. It does have, I did cut out the divider so it gives more room up here because she's probably not gonna run a spacer. And that's one of the things that got tested a lot on the dyno. The, really the only thing we did test was spacers. Um, so anyway, it doesn't have that. It's got a hydraulic roller camshaft and the duration number at 50 thousandths was 215 on intake and 232 on exhaust. And with one six ratio rockers, what it does have, which are these um, comp cams, die cast aluminum ones with the one six ratio, the lift was like 570, 560, 570. I, again, I can't remember off the top of my head. And I'll show you somewhere in this video you'll get to actual see the cam, um, the actual specs from the camshaft because I kept the box. Um, there's that. Um, on the dyno, I, I, we used a C and S 830 CFM carburetor. Now you would argue that that's not the ideal carburetor for that and you're correct because when it goes in the car, it's gonna have the sniper EFI system on it. So some might say, why didn't you dyno with that? Well, here's the reason why. On the dyno, they have diner headers, and they're one and three quarter inch uh, tube diameter, and they're really long. They're a sprint car header, and the reason why is because it's perfect for a dyno. It gives you more access to everything. You really don't want to run tight chassis headers because it's tough. I mean, spark plugs don't always fit. It's just more of a pain in the rear. So dyno headers are typically longer. Um, anyway, so that's what it is. Three inch collector, and that's what was used for testing. If we had hooked the sniper up to it, we'd be tuning to a header system that it's not running in the car. So there's the reason for that, not testing with the sniper. The CNS carburetor, the reason for that is because I don't have anything that's not small. My biggest or my smallest 4150 carburetor is 1,000 CFM. That's way too much for this. Um, I wasn't even for sure with the fuel right. So he had a dyno carburetor, the place where I went, which I'll tell in a minute, that they've used on everything. So anytime they dyno something in the, that requires a dyno, their carburetor, that's what they use. They've had it for years. It's got the um, aerosol billet um, boosters, which I'll show you a picture of right here. So 
that's the carburetor that was used. It's just used because that's what we had access to, or I had access to, it's his carburetor. Now, um, it does have an MSD distributor that's in it now, just because again, on the car, it's probably gonna have the hyper, um, the hyper spark set up from the Holly, but it just made things easier. It just clips in really quick. Um, let me see if there's anything else about this. The only other thing is it's got a shark tooth standard volume um, milling oil pump on it. And it's got this champ pan that looks stock, but it's actually got a windage tray and crank scraper. Beyond that, it's really nothing. So as far as the engine itself, it's the, probably the most basic thing you could imagine. I don't, I don't know if I said it, it's a hydraulic roller too. Um, really basic engine. You could do this one relatively cheap. The road heating assembly itself, and by the way, it came balanced, was like 570. Um, the balancer, this isn't even SFI approved. I think it was like 40 bucks. The camshaft and lifter are probably the most expensive part because the heads, the camshaft, if you were to get it for me, I'd charge you 600 because it's a custom one for me. But it, it's not that much cost to me. It is a billet core. I don't use Sadie cores. Um, it does have the Morel Street roller lifters in them, uh, hydraulic rollers. I will say they are so much quieter than their race version. Much quieter. I can live with that. Um, that's probably the most expensive part is the cam and the lifters. The heads, you might go, nah, those are really expensive. Not really. I think I, you can get them for like 450, I think, bare, and put your own stuff in them, which of course I did, because I cut it out to larger valves. Um, that's it, it's a basic combination. Now the place where I dynoed was different from where I dynoed the 406. This was in Enid, Oklahoma, because I wanted to go visit my mother, and that's where that dyno is. I have used that dyno before many times. It was the first dyno I ever got on. I like it. It's a Superflow 902. When you look at his power numbers, I promise you I could go to anywhere else and this thing's gonna pick up about 30 horsepower, anywhere around here, anyone I've ever been on besides this, it's gonna pick up about 30. His correction factor does not have inertia calculated into it. And if you use inertia, it actually corrects up. So um, it doesn't. So the numbers you're gonna see are, I would trust just about anywhere. I really would. So that's it. Um, how did it do? <laughs> here you go. Here's some dyno videos from you. So this first one you're gonna see is um, just breaking it in. Um, this is kind of one of the things he does to see if the uh, servo is working in the right position so he gets it where it should be. And that's what you're gonna see right now. Now, what he's doing with that, and I'm gonna try to explain, and I don't understand all of it, but I just try to get you a good idea. When he does that, he's trying to load the dyno itself so he can get the correct position on the valve on the servo, because according, and I'm not an expert on this, but the servo value should be between 90% and 20% as it goes through its sweep range. That's what he wanted, that's what he targets. And he always does that this way, it keeps it correct, I guess you could say. He's also gonna tell whenever he does that, if the air fuel ratios are looking way out to, to lunch. And in all fairness, we never changed a jet in the carburetor. And the reason for that is one, it's not going to the car. So as long as less it was really, really bad, it's not hurting anything. The air fuel ratio you're seeing on the screen, it's a calculated one. It doesn't come from an O2 sensor. And some of you might be confused by that thinking that air fuel ratio just come from O2 sensor. Well, on a dyno, you can use that but they also have this thing called an air hat and a fuel turbine. So essentially what happens is off the carburetor itself, up at the top, there's a, um, an air turbine that spins and it's measuring the amount of air that's coming through into the engine. So that's your air. Then it's got a different turbine that spins as fuel passes through and measures how much fuel goes in the carburetor. From those, it calculates your air fuel ratio. The catch with that is your turbine has to be correct on both the air and fuel for it to read correctly. So when you're looking at it, it actually looks really lean, but when I pull a plug, which I'll show you, it's actually rich. And there are some other indications too, which I'll show you in the dyno stuff. Now here's how it went. Of all the engines I've ever put on the dyno, this one right here has been the least problems. So he puts it on, he says, uh, the timing about right? He said, yeah, it should start up. Uh, so he goes, I guess we'll see. So he runs the fuel, does a little squirts, pops right off. Now the distributor's locked out, by the way. And he goes, well, let me go check the timing. I, go, I can do it. He goes, I'll just check it just to see. 36 degrees from the time I dropped it in, never turned it. Still hasn't been turned. So it's 36 degrees right off. 
Now, I know you're thinking, well, aren't you going to creep up on it? Aren't you going to start with like 32 and work your way up? Well, I figured, uh, must be God talking to me or something to get it right there at 36. Because that never happens. Usually you're off and you've got to turn the distributor down and fire up. But it isn't close enough or perfect timing. Seemed about right, so I figured, not ah, go with it. So, the first pull you're going to see here is a really small one. And I can't remember where he started with, and I don't have a copy of this dyno sheet. But I do know we went to 5300 RPM. Now, I'm going to point this out. We're dynoing on 91 um, pure gas. There's no ethanol in it. That's what we're using. And remember, the distributor is locked out at 36. So you're getting full throttle, full load at a low RPM, at least 3,000. I actually think we were starting at 2,500 on this pool. So for 2,500 to 5,300 RPM, and by the way, I forgot the compression on this, to tell you this. The compression is 9.8 to 1. So although it's a flat top piston that's sitting down in the whole 29,000s and got a 41,000 head gasket or 39, it's a cheap head gasket, that 7733 PT-2 or something, which I think, see, I think it's 39,000s. So the total uh, quench is way too much. Several of you said, it's gonna ping like crazy. Remember, it's uh, 36 degrees, locked out. Didn't ping. Here's the dyno. One quick thing before you look at the dyno videos, a couple of things to keep in mind. The numbers you see on his display are uncorrected, which means there's a correction factor, and I think you can see it off to the side of the screen, but the numbers that you're seeing there are uncorrected. When he pops up the actual results at the end, those are corrected, so remember that. So what you're seeing on the screen is uncorrected. That's the raw power it makes. And I will say those, it's a sampling issue, so it doesn't always exact, but you need to bring that up first. Just remember those are uncorrected. The correct numbers are at the end. Um, the other thing is it sounds, and if you've never been on a dyno, you wouldn't understand this, but if, if it sounds like the engine's knocking when it's at low idle speed, I promise you it's not. It's actually the dyno. There's an absorber and it bangs around in there. And that's where it creates that sound. Each dyno is a little bit different on the amount of sound it makes. For instance, when I was on the 406s, it wasn't near as loud. And it could be that his absorber part that clutch thing that he has on there is getting worn out and so it's making that sound but it's it was definitely loud at idle or the probably the more likely scenario is this is idle lower than i usually take them usually i'm idle like 1500 and this one's like a thousand so maybe it, it makes it worse because definitely when it comes up it goes away yeah i promise you it's not the engine just to make a point of it i already took apart the filter and cut it open and everything and i promise that's not it so just something to keep in mind when you're watching the video that the noise isn't a knock of the engine and that the numbers are uncorrected. So that's pool one. Now I forgot to tell you, when we started this whole test, I have a one inch open spacer that I put underneath this. It was a one inch phenolic, so it's plastic one, and the carburetor sitting there. That's what we started with. So we made our first test at 5300, all's good. The first thing I'm ready to do, we shut it off, we start looking for leaks. Because the one thing I, I don't really care what power I made, and I've said that before, what I don't want it to do is leak oil, and it didn't. Which I was like, yes. Because uh, it seems like sometimes you can get lucky and sometimes you can't. It just, they leak sometimes. No leaks yet. Yeah, yeah. I'll get to the leak we end up having, which is very small and you'll understand why in a minute. So anyway, from that point, it's like, do you want to move it up? Because the chart was just showing it's gaining our um, power. I said, yeah, let's just go to 6,000. Or let, actually, let's go to 58. So he does another pull to 58. I think this is the video.
So things are looking good. It's making pretty good power, pretty good torque. Things are looking right. Now, is it like crazy numbers? No, as you can tell, it's in the 400s. That's good. Uh, it's more than what a lot of you said it would make. My prediction, by the way, is 400 foot-pounds of torque and 400 foot -pound, uh, horsepower. Um, it's already got more than that on torque and on horsepower. So you're all looking pretty good. Um, now, it still hasn't found its peak. It's like you want to try it to 62. So yeah, let's just go to 62 and see what it does. Um, and the reason why it's creeping up is like, you know, just make sure of valve flow. Because after all, it is hydraulic roller and they're, say what you will, but they can be more susceptible to valve flow. So let's, sure, let's see what it does. When you watch this video, I want you to see something because I, I didn't capture this on camera. He even says this, but you're gonna see it making a smooth pull to 6,200 and you're gonna think it's going into valve flow because it's gonna do this weird where it's trying to jump RPMs. If you look at the graph and it looks jagged, but it's not going down, it's going up, jagged and up. Anyway, what I didn't capture on camera was him saying, if that's not your engine, I promise you, that's the dyno. The servo's been acting up. And the reason why is you're kind of at the end of the, at the range. And remember at the beginning of my video, he said, I want to keep it between 90 and 20. And usually when they roll in the throttle, the servo value is actually really high because you got to think the water has to, if this engine's already spinning, it takes more to slow it down to speed, then, then it doesn't take as much to let it accelerate. So the servo value is usually high at the beginning and then it backs off so that the engine can climb an RPM. Anyway, if you look at it, from the beginning of the run, it was like 90 something percent. At the end, it was getting down to 20 or below. And it, they say Superflow doesn't recommend that because it doesn't have as much control on the engine. And that's why it's trying to flip it up there. Which by the way, it didn't make that much of a difference anyway because the peak power, I think it occurred like at 58 or 6,000 RPM. So we're past that anyway, so it makes no difference. So anyway, at this point, we started doing another backup pull just to make sure everything's fine. Um, here's, I think, one of those pulls. fuel ratio there because I let it set settle in better here to let yeah. the fuel catch up. I'm bad about just doing it too quick and it has it show bigger or a leaner condition up here but that's 13 all the way down through there. 421. At this point it's like 420 torque and 420 horsepower which I will show you the charts by the way I promised I'll get the raw numbers for you. Um, but it, it's doing pretty good. Um, no complaints. And I said, well, it's not leaking and it's making enough power. And he goes, would you want to change the timing or nothing? I was like, no, not really. Cause it's making more than enough than what it needs to. And there's, yeah, I could probably move up to 38 degrees because the quench being so high, it's probably going to make a little bit more. But I said, there's really no point, you know, 36 degrees fine. It's not no signs of spark knock or nothing. And there's just no reason for it. And there was no reason to adjust the jets on the carburetor um, because after all, again, we're not using it. So the only thing I wanted to try was some spacers. So the next thing we uh, tested, and I'm gonna show you what these spacers are in the end, was we took off, and this is super quick. We took off the one inch and replaced it with a HVH four hole taper spacer that a customer was nice enough to let me borrow. And then put the carburetor back on and tighten everything back up and made a pull. Here's that pull. Now, when I show you the numbers, you're gonna be interested to see how much it actually changes because we did do a backup pull too. So we did not just one with that HVH, we did another backup to make sure they were lined up and they were within one. Um, so if you look at the numbers between the two, which I'll show you, you would expect some huge gains. You'd be disappointed. So the open spacer that was phenolic probably cost 40 bucks if that, and that HVH one was like 120. Hardly any difference. Hardly any. I think we're at 423 horsepower, you might have saw. So I was like, okay, well, that's great. There's only one more thing I want to try, and then let's just get it off. And I want to take out the spacers. So all we did was take all the spacers off and just put the carburetor directly onto the manifold with no spacers. And the reason for it is 
I'm not entirely sure she's having enough hood clearance anyway for a spacer. So I want to see if it's going to lose a bunch or whatever it's going to do. So I was just curious. And that would be our last two pulls, which um, actually last pull, because we didn't back up that one because um, it was literally super quick. Um, so the wall temperature, water temperatures were pretty close whenever we started. So took it off, put it back on. Here's that video. Here's what I mean about it being rich. This is how I read a plug. I'm sure everybody else might do it a different way. If I look really closely at it, you see that right here on the outside? That's actually NSEs. But this is the plug that comes from it. It's telling me it's rich. And here's how I read them. The circle that goes all the way around, the spark plug of metal at the top, that's what I read. And if it's got black all the way around, usually it means it's rich to me. If I see, I'm gonna set this down so I can kind of show you better. If I see more black on all the way around this ring here on the outside, typically that means it's rich to me. If I see it about three quarters of the way, I'm, I th usually think I'm pretty good. So three, actually um, three quarters where there's like, you could see some metal where it's not built up a carbon. So I got carbon three quarters away. I'm getting pretty close. When it's about half metal, half carbon, I'm right there, don't change a thing. And when I only see a quarter of the whole ring is carbon, then it's, almost on the leading side. And if you don't see any at all, then you for sure are. Now, the way you read timing, now each person does it different. If you look at this ground strap, what you're targeting is to have where the heat ends right where the bend is. Um, however, that's just wives tell. Honestly, the dyno and track tells you. Um, but you can think of these, Big Chief, you know, say what you will about Street Outlaws, but he does come up with some cool, good sayings. And one of the things he says was, these are the soldiers that are inside your engine. And they're going to tell you what's happening in the front lines. So in this case, even though that air fuel ratio from the dyno chart said it was lean, it's not. It's rich. And the timing looks like it's about right. It said 36. Um, by the way, if you have an end here, usually it means you have too much timing. So, which is weird because some of them, and that's another thing you can read too, is if you look at all the plugs, you'll see them different. So some of them were right in the center, and this one's almost at the end. Um just because like some get cylinders get hotter than others. Anyway, that's how I read it. And this is what the spark plug is. Thought I'd show you that real quick. So now you've seen the, all the dyno runs and I'll show you the data in a minute. But um, just to give you an idea how quick this was, I showed up there at 9.30 in the morning. I was did all that stuff I just said at my home, mom's home at 11.30, which means showed up at 9.30, Took this out of the truck, put it on the dyno, ran all the dyno tests, took it back off the dyno, put it back in the truck, and to my mom's house in two hours. That's fast. Um, needless to say, the dyno bill wasn't that bad, thank God. Um, the only oil leak, and I told you it was going to be small, is on a small block Chevy down here at the bottom where the fuel pump push rod goes through. I have forgotten because I haven't used a mechanical fuel pump in forever. I just left the bolt out. So we're looking around. He's really good about checking for oil leaks too. And 
you several people have asked why do you paint your engines yellow that's disgusting color well it started when i was younger because i couldn't see if there was an oil leak so i used to all paint them black like this and i couldn't ever figure out where the oil leaks were coming from figured like and by the way the gases weren't near as nice back then um so i couldn't ever find them so it's like i'm just gonna paint it yellow so i can find the oil leaks but this one's painted black so obviously my sister didn't want a yellow engine in her car respectable the only leak was like i said at that hole there's a bolt that should be there and I left it out and it sprayed oil onto the ground. Beyond that, everything else, perfectly dry. Okay, now for the parts you wanna see, the numbers. Here are the numbers. Now this first one I'm showing you is from this open spacer here. This is the spacer. It's a plastic, it's pretty simple. Phenolic, that's what it is, open. Here are the numbers. So if you look, this is at 3,100 RPM. So pretty low, 383 foot-pounds of torque, it makes peak torque at, looks like right there, at 4,800, at 422.6. As you can tell, it kind of carries this whole way. Peak power occurs at, let's see, right there, 5,800 at 424.6. That's what it is. Now, like I said, the air-fuel ratio, it, gets, it looks really rich or really lean here. Then it gets uh, richer, but it still looks really lean. This gives away that it's actually rich anyway. That says lean right through there, which it might have actually been. But it's definitely richer at the top. Uh, remember, at 440 is about where it really should be. When you're at 500, you're really rich, 0 0.500. Um, this is how much pounds of fuel it took to make the horsepower. So this is telling me it's rich. The plugs, plugs say the same thing, and I'll show you that in a minute. Anyway, this is open spacer, okay? Let's go to this one. Now, this is the next spacer that was tried. This is an HVH. It's the tapered one. It looks like this. I should point out too, HVH does make this spacer that's actually made for the dual plane. See how it's got that groove right there, that thing, right? I had boogered up this one and didn't ever do anything with it. That's the reason why I didn't test it or bring it with me. So instead I brought that one, but here's how it did. Set this down so it don't drop, okay. It makes at 3,100 when it starts, 391. So it's about, you know, I think it was 383. It's up there for sure. Peak torque is at 423.2 at 4,800. And peak horsepower is at 425 now at 5,800 RPM. So it's better. Now, if you notice, by the way, it did make it run um, leaner yet through the runs, at least according to that. But also even this was saying it's a little bit leaner, but still it looks, this makes it look scary lean. The plugs do not indicate that. This is what I mean by the calculated thing. Um, by the way, this is how much airflow is actually put through. So someone said a 600 CFM car should be good. You're correct. It's only pulling 527 out of an 830. Now, this is where it gets interesting. This is with no spacer. Three hundred ninety-five at the hit. So at 3,100 RPMs, it's 395 foot-pounds of torque. It goes to 423.6. As you can tell, it's not really losing. People, some Several people thought it would have low torque. It did not, even at the beginning. Strong there. And horsepower was 423.6. So as you can tell, the differences are so small, really small. Just to give you an idea, we'll put them here, and I'll show you the graph anyway. Just to kind of give you an idea. We have at 423.6, 425, 425. They're all so close as far as peak horsepower wise. And if you talk about the torque, um, if you look at peak torque 4,800, find it right there, 424, 423, 423. See how close they are? The numbers are pretty much the same whether it has a spacer on it or not. Now, this one will give you a better idea of what you're actually looking at, though. I'm going to show you some different graphs and just to kind of get you an idea. So this will tell more of the story than what you think. If I can kind of move. Nope. Grabbing too many papers. Not that one. That was just, this is a backup pull between four and five. But the one I want is that one. These are all the runs. All seven runs are on the paper. So if you look, they're all pretty close. And this is that jagged line. See how the servo was kind of acting up on that one? 
I don't know what run that is, but that's one of the early ones, probably, I don't even know, I think number four, maybe. But the one, the best look one to look at is this one right here. If you look, almost every one of them follow this curve except for this right here. Because if you look from here on, they're relatively the same except for where the servo's acting up on that one. And even kind of up here on those, which by the way is past where peak is, so I'm not really caring. But it's about the same, kind of see? Ignoring that one. That is different. This one is number seven, which is no spacer. <laughs> That's right. That no spacer did that. That actually makes more torque from 3,000, or actually 3,100, to it looks like, look right there. Let's see, 4,200. That's the spot where it's better with having no spacer. So anyway, there's some numbers for you. I thought you'd get a kick out of it. Now I'm gonna go through some of the comments um, for this. And I'll pull back up the other numbers so you can look at them while I'm talking. Um, first one was, why didn't you run a thinner head gasket? Like a shim? That's a great question. And I did think about doing it so it'd help out the quench and probably would have made more. The reason why I didn't was because I didn't surface the block. And because of that, I wasn't entirely sur sure that the surface of the block was smooth enough to accommodate a just steel shim head gasket. And I didn't want to take the chance of it leaking. After all, this isn't a huge performance still, so there was no point to it. Next, if you change the LSA, we'll actually just pause for some second while I grab the cam. Never mind, it's right here. Here are the cam specs again, which is 215 intake duration, that's a 232, it's a 112. It says 540 and a 535, but that's with a 1.5. Remember, I'm running 1.6s, so it's actually a little bit higher. Um, there you go. Several people thought it would be horrible, just to make sure it's 232. Yep. Um, said it was going to be suck on torque. Um, but anyway, the reason again for this, because it wanted to have a smooth idle, great vacuum, which it did, smooth as could be. Um, so the question was, if I change the LSA, if I tighten it up, would it bring up the torque and stuff? Absolutely. This cam is not meant for, boom, I'm telling you, this is the best cam for this engine. That's not what this is. This cam is um, for what she wanted as far as calmness. So if I was to say the, take the uh, LSA and change it to a 106, these torque numbers would have came up, but it would have also been very peaky. So all this would have probably came up by about 20, and it made probably at here, maybe 10 foot pounds more torque, but it would have fallen off harder with the same duration numbers. From my experience, that would have happened. So yes, you could have, but also would have hurt the idle quality. It would have been choppy and she would have hated that. She would have been mad at me. Next one, um, someone said, this was a bad cam choice and look for high EGTs. On the video, you can clearly see the EGTs. They were at 1250 and we could have added more, two degrees more of timing and actually cooled that off. The EGTs did not get too high. They were about what you'd expect. So, I don't know. I would don't argue, and I'm not saying they're wrong. This or this cam, the duration, sure did put more exhaust in the uh, heat in the exhaust, but it did make things more calm. However, it did not hurt torque. And going back to the no spacer thing again, 395 foot pounds of torque at 3,100 RPM is not low torque, especially when it makes a peak at 424. So it's only gaining 24 foot pounds of torque through that range. So yeah, it's it's pretty good on torque. I'm not worried about it not moving out of its way. The next one was, why didn't you do a 383? I mean, the, uh, the rotating assembly costs the same. Here's the reason why. Um, again, she is, it's going to an 88 Firebird. If you know anything about those, they have a 10 bolt rear end and seven and a half inch deal. So it's not the strongest rear end. She's not gonna be putting a four nine inch in it um, or paying me to put a four nine inch in it. I'm not gonna do that for her. She doesn't even care, she just wants it reliable. So adding more torque to one wheel that's only gonna spin anyway is probably not the best. This is thing I can already tell you when you, you heard him when he flips that throttle on that last pool, thing's responsive. Um, with the snipers, probably even more. It's gonna be, she's gonna have enough, this is enough, more than enough for what she needs anyway. So adding more torque is not going to make her life happier. So the last thing I wanna leave with is, the last video I had a hundred and more than a hundred comments. And I asked you to guess the horsepower and torque. Nobody guessed the numbers. 
and including myself. I missed it by more than 20 from what I thought it would be. The reason why I bring this up is because the internet's great for a bunch of things, but you can ask the internet thousands of people a response to a question, and several times, none of them will be correct. And it's not because they're idiots or they don't know anything, it's just sometimes we don't have the full picture and we can't see it all. So I mention that because when you ask a question on the internet, they're gonna give you the best that they know. And sometimes they get closer and sometimes it's further away. This is a prime example. I didn't think it would do this either. So if you ask a question on the internet, take that information, I'm not saying toss it, take that as a piece of information, and then gather more pieces of information and form your opinion on what you think from the information you gathered to tell you. Don't just rely on one thing. Because if you looked at it, several people I can already tell you had read and heard different things about camshafts and what it would do. And as soon as that, thought this thing was going to be horrible on torque. And it isn't always the case. It just isn't. And I'm not faulting anybody. I don't want to be like, hey, man, I know everything. You guys don't know anything. No. Clearly, I don't. The 406 was a perfect example of clear I don't. So, But I have a pretty good in idea of a lot of things. But I miss it, too. So, anyway, hopefully that gives you some more information. But, because you stuck around, I'm going to tell you one little bonus nugget of knowledge. This is your bonus nugget of knowledge. And the reason why I'm even doing this, and I'm going to start trying to do something special at the end of each video. And the reason why is because people don't watch all the way through the end. And I don't blame you. you got stuff to do. I totally get that. I really do. But do you ever wonder why Marvel puts like in credit scenes at the end of their movies? So you stick around. I only point that out because in that 406 video, the video was 45 minutes long. Probably too long, but it took a lot of it explaining. Several of the comments never watched the whole video because at least five people said, you need to, you should check that cam. It's probably off. It's gotta be off. And if you'd watched the video, you would have already seen it been on the cam doctor and I'd already done that, but they didn't finish the video. So because you stuck around in the end, I'm going to tell you this story from Gary, which is the guy who, Gary Dunsworth, who owns Dunsworth Machine, who done with this. Because I hadn't heard this before, new to me, but uh, I thought I'd share it with you. So just for those that don't know, Gary Dunsworth, Dunsworth Machine, and they do a lot of engines, circle track engines, race engines, just about everything. And I will tell you, like, I have, there's people I admire or I think are really smart. He is probably the smartest one about finding out what a problem is and fixing it. Uh, and I'm being serious. If you've got a problem, you just quite cannot understand what's going on or what happened. He's the one to ask. Um, and it, you might say, what about the 406? It didn't have a problem. It made power. It, I'm talking like mechanical problem. So here's the story he was telling me. He goes, you're lucky you got on today because... This is him telling me because I had the problem with the engine that came in before yours and it was a small block Chevy. It was a 383. And he said a customer brought it in to be dyno and he always primes them first. So he takes out the distributor, primes it, make sure it's got oil pressure because there's no sense in firing it out the thing and the oil pressure anyway on the dyno. It's just going to tear up the engine. So he's priming it and he's spinning the, spinning the drill and it's spinning the oil pump and all of a sudden it grabs the drill and yanks it out of his hand. He's like, whoa, that is not good. So he calls up the customer, uh, tells him what's happened. He goes, I'm, you know, I could probably, I could take off the pan and see what's going on. Maybe I could find out what it was. And this is the reason why I'm sharing it with you guys, because I hadn't heard of this ever happening. Uh, by the way, he didn't put the engine together. What had happened was on the small block Chevy and big block Chevy actually too, on your main cap, that's where you bolt your oil pump to, right? Well, I use studs. I use a stud that goes through there that holds the oil pump on. Some people use the bolt, but if you ever notice on the stock caps, it's tapered. So where your threads are, it tapers up and into the gallery. So I'm doing it from, if I was looking at the main cap, looking up, you can see it. It tapers this way. Well, what had happened was, is whenever they put it in and they used a bolt or whatever, evidently part of where it was tapered, part of that metal at the very top, and I've seen this action in caps before, luckily I just haven't had it, it, it broke off. So the threads were still holding it because it's still in that part, but the taper part, the thread part of that metal there had broke off and it got shoved into the pump in some way. And I'm not sure how that happened, but somehow it went to the pump and locked it up. 
So I think what had happened was they must have had the engine upside down. The stuff broke off. It fell into the passage. So you main cab up here. They, I'm sure they did it here, but when they turned the engine over, the metal must have fell right into the oil pump, got into the gears, and locked it up. Threw it at the primer out of his hand. So he calls the customer up, tells him everything he knows. He says, I'm going to try it. I can take apart the pump, get this metal out. I'm hoping I can get it out. I'll put magnets everywhere. But it's your baby at this point, and we'll see if, what happens. And he goes, I, you know, I searched everywhere, looked on that cap, make sure as much of the pieces had come off as possible. Puts it back on and um, puts it, does his priming, primes, looks, everything looks good. Uh, hopefully that the filter has grabbed anything that's left, otherwise the metal would have been in, magnets have gotten it. Puts the distributor in, fires it up, and it's running real good, and then bam, stops. Pulls out the distributor, broke two of the teeth off, and he's like, stop. And by the way, this is at a low RPM, so no other real damage. And there's no real way, to, he even said, there's no way of getting all the metal out without tearing it all the way down. So I was giving him that option too. But he's like, just give it a shot, because it goes, it's your baby at this point. And he goes, just give it a shot, and we'll see what happens. Um, so anyway, after broke off the two teeth, he's like, no, whatever, whatever it is, we need it now at this point. I'm sure the, you know, in his mind, and his, he's probably correct on this, probably most of the parts are fine. But if you tried fixing it again, it wouldn't be worth it. Because now you've got two broke off teeth besides the other metal that's in there. So it needs to be tore down. Um, so he tells the customer all that. But the only reason why I bring that story up to you is because be careful on the caps. I have never heard of that. And I've, I've seen some caps where, there's a, where the bolt goes through where some chunk is missing. But I've never seen where it's chunk, big chunks have come off. But I totally could see how it could happen. So my nugget of knowledge to you is for you small block, big block Chevy guys with the stock caps, really take a close look at that and see. My strongest recommendation is you should use a stud and not a bolt to hold the oil pump on. This has a stud. Everything in mine has studs on that. Um, the other thing to watch out for too on the stock caps as well, and I don't think this gets said enough either, is... Um, Sometimes those threads, they go too far. I've seen this happen where someone would just grab a bolt because it's the same bolt that's like for your heads and stuff. But it will, on the stock caps, they're drilled all the way through. So I've seen where it's gone all the way and it actually bottoms out and pushes against the main bearing itself on the crank and then it gets tighter. So just something to keep in mind. Those are my little nuggets. And most of you probably already know that. Studs usually don't have a problem with that, by the way, because their threads are, you gotta get an idea. The solution, by the way, is just measure. Just use a little micrometer, measure the thread depth, measure the thread depth. Oh, you're good. You're, you know, 200 thousandths away from the bearing underneath. Golden. Aftermarket blocks, by the way, don't have that problem because they're, they don't, they don't drill them all the way through. Anyway, because you stuck around the end, you got that. Uh, thanks for watching. And please don't think I'm trying to be arrogant with this. This is, I mean, it's a great motor. I mean, 420 horsepower, you know, 424 pounds torque. It's great, but this doesn't make me good. <laughs> this doesn't make me good. This just makes me, uh, me. <laughs> if, I'm, I'm, it's a decent motor, but it's nothing really to brag about. And you might think I'm bragging this time. No, it's more like a lot of people thought was right, but they weren't. And I kind of had an idea, but this isn't, this is not a bragging engine. It isn't. So other would be like, yeah, it is. But no, this is just, it's good. It's, it's not fantastic, but it'll work for what she wants. It's perfect for what she wants. Anyway. Thanks for watching.